Right, hello everyone. I hope everyone can hear us. Um, please write a comment in the chat section if you can't hear us. Um, so this is the first webinar of three lectures on the CST interview. Um, we've been lucky enough to have Gary Kai presenting today. Thank you for letting me know you can hear me. Um, Gary Kai is a core surgical trainee in his first year in London. Um, he's doing a plastics themed job at the moment. Um, he applied last year and scored, uh, ranked in the top 1% of all applicants, which is incredible, and scored uh, a whole 96% in his course surgical training interview. So we're very lucky to have him here today to take us through some tips for smashing the clinical section of the interview. Um, so if everyone's ready to start, uh, we'll leave it to you, Garikai. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Freya, for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, hi everyone, as Freya said, I am a CT1 currently at Chelsea Westminster doing a plastic surgery themed post. Um, Freya asked me to essentially just sort of give an overview of the core surgical training interview, which I believe is coming up in a few weeks time. Um, more specifically focusing on the uh, clinical station and even more specifically on the CRISP um, sort of aspect of that. So I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer as, um, as many sort of questions as I believe you might have. Um, I'll mostly focus this talk based on sort of how I approached the interview and what I found to be useful and sort of the structures that I developed to help me um, answer uh, specific questions within the interview itself. Um, ideally, I would have liked this to be interactive, but I, I don't imagine I'll be able to speak to anyone. Um, but, you know, if you've got any questions, just uh, throw them in the chat and I'll try and answer them when I can. Um, so hopefully without further ado, let's get started. Uh, I'm working. Oh, perfect. So it's just clicking. So introductions out of the way. Um, I have to apologize, but my slides are actually just fairly basic and just clean. So um, it'll mostly just be me talking. There'll be prompts on the screen. Um, but yeah, hopefully you shouldn't get too tired of my voice. But basically, so the, the session outline for today is obviously, as I said, I'll be going through the CST interview format for 2023. Um, I'll be going through a few of the resources that I used personally and how I prepared for my interview last year. I'll go through the CRISP algorithm as well, um, as obviously that's quite important to understand before you go for the interview. Um, this is particularly pertinent for um, for people that may not have sat CRISP, um, it's, you know, for those who are you know, F2s applying for CST, you may not necessarily have had the opportunity to attend a CRISP course. Um, so this may be fairly useful. And also how to structure your answers. So I'll go through a few frameworks that I used myself um, to help structure the answer within the interview. And I'll go to help illustrate those points. I'll be going through a um, an example scenario as well and finish off with some general tips. Okay. Um, so this is all sort of, I guess, fairly uh, common knowledge. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, as far as I'm aware, the CST interview format for 2023 should still all be online. Um, last year, when I sat the interview, this was on Microsoft Teams. So the structure is it's a 20 minute interview divided into two 10 minute stations, one of which is a clinical station and the other is a leadership and leadership and management station. Um, your clinical station uh, is further divided into sort of, I guess you can broadly categorize them into either an ATLS or trauma uh, station where all your questions are trauma related, as well as a care of the critically and uh, ill surgical patient station uh, in which you're often presented with a patient who's unwell, often post-operative, or just a, a generally unwell patient that you have to assess and manage on the ward. You usually have two interviewers. Often these are consultants, um, but you can get a mixture of a consultant and a senior registrar. So don't be surprised if you get one of the two. And overall, the interview itself is worth 144 points, which is a, a whole two thirds of your total score. So as you can imagine, it's quite important to um, to make sure that you're you're well prepared and you can approach the interview as best um of your ability as possible um and this you know requires a lot of preparation beforehand and 
um, as we'll go through in the next few slides. So preparation. Um, well, I, I guess, you know, this this depends on each individual. Some people are more com confident with interview um, interviews in general, others uh, not necessarily. Um, myself, I generally wasn't, you know, I'm not the type to, to perform um, confidently in interviews. So I often require a lot more practice and a lot more uh, preparation beforehand. So I started preparing roughly two to three months before, um, you know, starting fairly slowly, interview practice here and there with friends, and then progressively increasing the intensity, practicing every day, practicing multiple times a day um, until the day of the interview. And if you think about it, this, this makes a lot of sense, right? Because as an interview, it's essentially a performance and you don't want the first time that you're saying some of your answers uh, to be on on the interview day. You want to have rehearsed and fine-tuned your answers so that when you say them on interview day that they're as succinct and as clear as possible. So with this in mind, my first bit of advice, and you know, this is completely sort of, I suppose, obvious and um, and I hope I'm not teaching you to suck eggs, but I think it's, I can't, you know, understate the importance of just practicing saying your answers verbally. You know, this this could be saying your answers in the mirror when you wake up, as sad as that sounds, sometimes it can help. Um, but what I found to be incredibly useful was to have an interview practice partner. So this could be someone that you're applying with um, in the same year. You know, every evening after work, you spend an hour practicing with each other. And this is good because it encourages accountability uh, between the two of you. It also means that you're practicing with someone that you know. Um, it's not as high pressure. Um, you can sort of pick things up from the other person that you may not have necessarily considered. It's just a good way of getting into that mindset of speaking confidently and naturally um, until you sort of can fine tune uh, your responses closer to the time. Once you've had some time to build your knowledge base, um, and this can be done using either books or online resources or even um, in-person courses, you can then start to practice with uh, current core trainees because you know these are people who've gone through the experience that you're going to go through. That you're going to go through. So uh, you know these are probably the best people that you can actually practice with because it's fresh in their minds. Most CTs that I know are always willing to help. Um, and they probably have a bit more time on their hands than registrars and consultants. They're a bit more approach, a, a bit more approachable, and I guess it also helps them with um, sort of teaching points. So practice with core trainees whenever you can, and finally to to add that extra element of, I guess, pressure, which you know is fairly representative of the interview itself. Try and get comfortable speaking to registrars and consultants. Um, going through clinical scenarios and answering them in a structured manner to develop, um, I suppose, that, 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 that mindset, uh, which would help you on the day of the interview. So common resources, um, these are all fairly, uh, I suppose, well-known, fairly standard. Um, I should really have included some images on my slides, uh, but there's the green and white book, um, which is of the classic you know, sort of core surgical training interview book that everyone uses. Um, I used that as well, personally, and I think it provides a really good background um, to help build your knowledge uh, prior to the interview. The one downside, I have to admit, is that it's it's a fairly, sorry, a fairly outdated uh, textbook published in 2015, I believe. Um, therefore, some of the scenarios may not necessarily be up to date. Um, it doesn't really cover clinical scenarios in as much detail. Um, if at all. So, you know, this, it's a good resource, but it's also still worth supplementing with other resources out there as well. For the, um, I suppose for the clinical uh, governance aspect and sort of the management questions, the ISCP medical interview book, which I believe is a white one um, with small icons on the front cover, that's quite good um, for all your management and leadership uh, style questions and all your ethical scenarios as well. Fine, so with that sort of out of the way, um, obviously I'll be going through the clinical station and I'll be focusing on the CRISP algorithm. Now, I when I applied, I hadn't sat um, or attended a CRISP event. And I don't think F2s are eligible to attend a CRISP event. So I think it's fair to say that most of you going 
into the CST application process won't have had the opportunity to attend. Um, but there are still resources out there that you can use to help develop your knowledge um, around the CRISP algorithm. And uh, this is sort of one of the frameworks that the Royal College has um, provided. I had a look at this and I tweaked it um, slightly to make it, I suppose, personal to me um, and to give me prompts that I think that I found to be useful during the interview. So as a general structure, um, it's a bit more than just your ATE. I know when, you, when you've been practicing, most people would, you know, describe the clinical um, interview as just an ATE sort of OSCE style um, uh, interview process, but it's, it's a bit more than that. And the interviewers are looking to see how well-rounded you are and your, your broader knowledge of uh, clinical assessment of an unwell patient. And they're also looking to see how structured you can, um, you can provide your answers uh, during the interview as well. So when you're presented with your, um, or your scenario, you will obviously undertake your immediate uh, management. This is your, your A to E structure. So you'll go through the airway, breathing, circulation, um, dysfunction of CNS, and then exposure. So that would be the first sort of uh, section of, of your response. Um, soon after that, you then need to demonstrate that you're trying to gather as much information to help you diagnose and manage this patient. And this includes looking at things like uh, drug charts, uh, news charts, as well as the operative notes if it's, an, if it's a post-operative patient, um, as well as any other available results as well, bloods, uh, images. And I think if you take a step back and you, you know, forget that it's an interview, these are all things that you would do naturally anyway. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that um, this forms part of the process of assessing a critically unwell patient. Once you've gathered as much information and you've examined the patient and you, you're starting to have an idea about what's going on, then you need to make a decision about whether this patient is stable and they potentially need further definitive management. Often this is theater. Or if the patient is, is stable and um, you know you can sort of do certain things to, to make sure that you keep an eye on them and um, essentially implement a daily management plan. If the patient is unstable, uh, naturally you would want to optimize and escalate this. So uh, you would take bloods, you would take any uh, imaging if need be, and you would discuss this patient with the immediate team as well as the surrounding MDT team as well, because I think it's important. These are sort of one of the buzzwords that you have to mention, I suppose, with any sort of medical talk. You know, you're you're looking after this patient, yes, immediately by yourself, but ultimately to provide definitive management, this requires an MDT approach. So this would require discussion with ITU and HDU if the patient is really unwell, uh, the theater coordinators and the CPOD team as well, as well as your immediate seniors, so your registrar and your consultant. If if the patient is well, and this does come up sometimes as a um, a curveball type question. So the interviewer could say to you, fine, okay, you've been called to see a patient who's in a lot of pain, um, but they are otherwise well. How would you manage this patient? Um, so, you know, you go to the patient, you still assess them, but very briefly, you still do your A to E assessment. But what they're trying to get at is your knowledge of this daily management plan, which most people don't quite know. So this list of things here is what you would usually go through on your morning ward round. So on a post-operative patient, when you see the patient in the morning, you have a look to see if they've had any x-rays or bloods. Um, if you need to discuss any complications, you can discuss them. Make sure you get nutritionists involved. Um, you have a look at the fluid charts as well in the morning, oral intake. Is the pain management uh, optimized? Are they mobilizing post-operatively, you know, ERAS protocol? Um, do they have any drains or tubes in situ? Um, all of these of holistic things you can discuss if you think that your patient is well enough. Otherwise, more often than not, the patient is unwell and you have to assess them. Fine. By the way, if you have any questions about this, please add them to the chat as well, and I'll try and um, address them as I go along. Fine. So now focusing specifically on how to structure your answer. So this, this is down to personal preference, I guess. Um, for me, this is what I found to be the most natural 
the most structured way to, uh, you know, answer a, a question in a composed and logical manner. It includes the, you know, aspects of the uh, CRISP protocol. So your immediate management is still on there. Your uh, full patient assessment and your investigations and definitive management are all still on there. But it also includes other things as well, which just help to round off your answer and impress the interviewer uh, to demonstrate that you you are composed, you're thinking about the answer, um, and you're, I suppose, generally taking a taking a step back to have a take a broader look at the patient before you answer. Um, so very quickly, uh, usually the interview will give you a um, scenario. So it could be a patient who's come back from theatre. It could be a few hours after theatre. It could be a few days after theatre. They're unwell, and the nurse has called you to the ward to come and come and assess the patient. Um, it can be tempting to um, start off by, you know, reading off your ATE assessment. And although this isn't necessarily wrong, um, you're still sort of going in the right direction. It's often better to set the scene and signpost and get those early marks as soon as you can. So this is why I've added an opening statement, because you want to show that you, yes, you know that you'll have to ultimately undertake an ATE assessment, but overall what what are the the key things that you're that you want to signpost within your answer uh in the first 30 seconds because this is an opportunity for you to take control of the interview and then if you start off strong the interviewers can relax they know that okay fine we've got a candidate here who has done this before they're very confident they know what they're doing once you've um reeled off your opening statement which is chock full of buzzwords you then initiate your um your a to e assessment now, I think at this stage, it's important to remember that your your interview is is not actually like an OSCE. I think you've got three minutes to to answer your question um, as a whole. So you need to be able to thoroughly but succinctly give out all of your points um, without losing any marks. So this requires a lot of practice. I think most people would um, I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting to the example of the opening statement in the next slide. Um, so most people would, um, you know, would say, okay, fine, you know, go through your A to E, but uh, take your time. I think it's important to remember that you've got three minutes, so try and go through it as quickly as you can. And then, as we said, full patient management, investigations, and definitive management. Perfect. So if we go through an example scenario, um, you know, you've been called to the uh, to the ward to assess a patient who's post-operative. They've had a small bowel anastomosis in theatre, but the patient tells you that this patient has a low blood pressure. Um, the question is usually, how would you assess this patient? How would you examine and manage this patient? What would you do in this scenario? And I think, you know, having a look at this, I think you you should automatically start to be wondering, OK, fine, what, what actually could be wrong with this patient? Uh, you should start to have some ideas. So as I said before, don't jump straight into your ATE, um, signpost early. And what I found to be useful, an example opening statement um, that is well-rounded is one that demonstrates that you, you recognize that this patient isn't well. So this patient, you literally have to say it, spell it out for the interviewer. This patient is critically unwell and I would want to assess them immediately. So this, if you have a look at your, your scoring matrix, you're marked on your ability to prioritize. You stating that this patient isn't well and you want to go see them straight away is automatically saying to the interviewer, okay, fine, I'm concerned about this patient. I'm, I need to go see them straight away. Next, you can then demonstrate that you, you are a forward thinker. So often you'd have, been, you'd have been bleeped by the nurse if you're elsewhere or the nurse would have given you a phone call. You can ask the nurse over the phone or anyone else who calls you to get the drug chart ready, the fluid chart and the operative notes. This is signposting and demonstrating to the interviewer that, okay, I'm already thinking about what sort of information I'm going to need to, to assess this patient. And then obviously when you get to the patient's bedside, you want to then reel out your buzzwords. So I'm going to assess, I'm going to escalate the CRISP protocol um, and assess this patient in an A to E fashion. So, you know, this will take you 20 seconds, 15 to 20 seconds to say this. But overall, already, you've already mentioned that this is a critically unwell patient. Um, this is someone you want to go see straight away. You want the relevant documentation there available for you to use. And you're signposting that you're going to use the CRISP protocol uh, following an A to E management.
so already you're you you've, you're off to a good start there okay once once you've done that then you want to quickly assess assess the patient so as i said earlier on you want to try and get this done and out of the way as soon as possible so airway you would literally just speak to the patient if the patient is speaking back to you the airway is patent and you move on to breathing and you know that's literally one sentence don't waste too much time you may get some scenarios where um, the patient could be struggling to breathe or they could be hypoxic. At this point, it's, you know, I think you have to tailor this framework to whatever clinical scenario that you get. If you're worried that the patient has airway compromise, then you would mention that you would um, start airway maneuvers, use airway adjuncts, um, start this patient on oxygen. Um, so although the framework is f fairly generic, you still need to tailor it slightly to whatever clinical scenario you're provided in the interview. Breathing, once again. So the way I sort of like to structure each of these sections is um, I'm at the bedside. First, I want to have a look at the observations and then examine the patient and then intervene. So observations first, fine. Um, for breathing, it's the respirate and the SATs. Is that available for me to have a look at? Good. Once that's I've, I've got that information, I can just quickly examine the patients. So for breathing, you just palpate, percuss, and auscultate. And then what do I need to do to intervene? It depends on what I find. So, you know, in most patients, uh, this patient is um, hypotensive. Um, depending on what they're saturating, I could start them on high flow oxygen for an honorable breather mask uh, or get a chest X-ray as well in case they have a PE. Um, well, I suppose for a PE, you'd then get a CTPA, but there could be other uh, respiratory pathologies that you could rule out at this point. If you're worried that they are um, hypoxic or actually do have a, P have a PE, then you can get an ABG as well. So as an example, um, a very quick statement, I would say, um, I would recheck this patient's respirator and oxygen saturations before palpating, percussing, and auscultating the chest. Don't be tempted to describe every little thing that you would do. Um, I think the interviewer just wants to know what would you do succinctly. So you want to palpate, you want to percuss, and you want to auscultate. Um, I would start this patient on high flow oxygen for a non would be the mask and get a chest X-ray and an ABG if needed. And that would literally be it for B. For C, for circulation, once again, same structure as before, OBS, examine, intervene. So, you know, for circulation, the main things we're worried about, um, this patient is hypotensive, so they could be hemodynamically unstable. So I want to check the heart rate, the BP, and the cap refill. Those are the main three things that you want to check for, for circulation. Uh, when you examine, you examine the peripheries. Are they clammy? Um, are they warm? Uh, fluid status, looking at skin turgor and mucous membranes, pulses, and you would auscultate the heart as well. And that's done. That's, that's your examination done. Uh, it, for interventions uh, and investigations, you would get an ECG, obtain IV access, bloods, fluids, transfusion if need be, and don't forget the catheter. This is something I always used to forget. A catheter allows you to monitor this patient's fluid output. So it's quite an important, especially for this uh, for this scenario. So this, this circulation I find for most scenarios is usually the chunkiest bit because there's a lot going on that you sort of need to justify um, at this point. So I suppose for this for this patient, we're worried about hemodynamic dynamic compromise. So I want to make sure that I, I signpost that I want to do a fluid status assessment by, check, by checking all the observations, um, as well as the skin tiger and mucous membranes. Um, you listen to the heart, although this is of very little significance, it's still important that you'd still mention it. Ultimately, you want to get an ECG for this patient, but more importantly, you want to establish IV access. And, you know, buzzwords again, IV access in both anticubital fossae. Um, now, you take a step back and you think, okay, fine, what would I do in what order? Once you've got IV access, the next natural thing is to get bloods. You usually wouldn't start fluids before getting blood. So you get bloods after you get IV access and you have a think about the scenario. So what bloods is this patient going to need? Um, generally, a um, full blood count, renal profile and CRP won't really, you know, you can't go far wrong if you mention those three. I think those are sort of basic baseline. Um, and then you think more carefully about what sort of information you, what you think is going on in the background. So if this patient has um, an ischemic bowel or an anastomotic leak, their lactate could be raised, raised as well. This patient has a low blood pressure 
um, they likely have peripheral hypoperfusion, so a lactate would be raised as well. So you, a VBG wouldn't be a bad shot at this point. If you're worried about a bleed, you can also get a HP from a VBG as well. So that immediately gives you instant feedback, something that you can use. Um, finally, you're planning for planning ahead once again. So if ultimately there is a bleed or if there is a leak, this patient may potentially need to go to theater. So a cross match um, if they need uh, urgent transfusion. If they're in shock, then you may also consider a, a massive hemorrhage protocol as well. And once again, as I said, make sure that this patient is catheterized. Okay, so moving on to D, um, uh, dysfunction of CNS. Once again, OBS, examine, intervene. So you check up blood glu glucose at this stage, you assess the pupils to see whether they are um, equal, reactive to light and accommodation, and you check the GCSS, uh, G GCS. If you're worried, you can get a CT head, um, but generally I, I suppose for this for this scenario that necessarily wouldn't be indicated um, once again very brief sentence i would ass then assess the patient's conscious level using gcs scale i would request a ct head if this is less than 13 so have a look at your ct head indications um and then assess the pupils and the glucose level as well and that's that's disability done finally exposure um obs you want to measure the temperature you want to examine in a head to toe fashion you want to ha closely have a look at the surgical sites. Are they infected? Um, you want to have a look at the abdomen. Is it soft? Are they peritonitic? Um, and the calves as well. Do you think this patient may have a, um, a DVT? So in your statement, you want to say that you would assess, you would expose this patient whilst maintaining dignity and normal thermia. Um, I think often when you're under stress and you're anxious in the interview, it's quite, you know, it's quite easy to forget all of these holistic things that make you a well-rounded trainee. You know, you're exposing the patient, but you don't want them to get cold. You want to make sure that they are fully covered. Um, and then you would look at the surgical sites. You would examine the abdomen if need be. You would examine the calves to make sure that they are not tense, that the patient does, doesn't have a DVT. Examine for PR bleeding. This is an, a, an, a, an abdominal scenario. So never forget to examine for PR bleeding as well or rashes. Um, and finally, you would take a temperature as well of the patient. Okay, so you've finished your ATE, which should take you roughly two minutes, two and a half minutes. Um, you then want to move on to gathering as much information as possible. So, you know, you would say to the interviewer, okay, fine. Um, as long as this patient is stable, I would want to take a focused history if they're able to talk. Um, otherwise, I would also have a look at the drug chart. Are they on any medications that could be making them hypotensive? Um, I'd have a look at the operative notes. Were there any complications? Was, was it a difficult closure, difficult anastomosis? What is the risk of an anastomotic leak? Um, was the patient oozy? Could they be bleeding? All of this information you can get from an op, from an op note. Have a look at the news chart as well. You know, well, what was their news score? a few hours, you know, from now? What was their new score yesterday? Um, are they trending downwards? Are they trending upwards? Is this, um, uh, you know, an insidious thing? Has it just only, has it only just occurred? All, all of this, all of this documentation really helps you get a proper picture of what's going on with the patient. And then finally, as you would do normally, you'd have a look at any, um, so let's go back, you'd have a look at any perioperative imaging um, and blood results as well, as this can give you information about what could be going on and how to best manage the how to best manage the patient. Which leads you on to investigations. So, you know, once again, always ensure to structure your answer. So when you're talking about investigations, I think as you go through your ATE, you'll find that naturally you mention most of your bedside investigations. So you would do your uh, your blood gas. You would uh, check your respirate or your BP. So most of things, most of these things. A the good thing about the structure is that most of these things you would have mentioned anyway, um, which only really leaves uh, your radiological and definitive investigations. So um, a common statement, one that I sort of prepared for most scenarios because I knew I'd have mentioned most of these investigations during my ATE was um, you would state that you've requested the plim, plim, blah, blah, this word plim, preliminary studies or investigations at the bedside. And then you now want to uh, request your definitive investigations. And these are uh, specific to the scenario itself. So in this patient, if you're worried about a perforation, you would get an abdominal x-ray. 
Um, or you would get a, a, a CT abdomen pelvis to have a look for a, an anastomotic leak or a small bleed. Once that is done, um, you then focus on your definitive management. So finally, with all this information that you've gathered, what is actually going on with the patient? And I think it's important to try and state what you think is going on. Uh, you don't have to say it's one thing. You could say, okay, fine, my suspicion of an anastomotic leak is quite high because this patient is hypertensive, they look to be in shock. It could be an uh, intra-abdominal bleed because they're post-operative, they're in shock and they're hypotensive. Um, it could also be cardiogenic shock as well. Uh, this patient could um, be having an MI and they are uh, in shock as a result. So start to have a think about what you think, what you think could be going on and mention your differentials as well. So once you have an idea, well, what are you going to do? Does this patient need to go to theater or could you manage them on the ward? Often, um, and I think this scenario is alluding to the fact that this patient likely has an, anast an anastomotic leak or an intra-abdominal bleed. So this patient may need to go to theater. If they need to go to theater, um, common things, so keep them, keep them nil by mouth, get your group and save, document the last oral intake, consent them if they're alert, uh, mark them if appropriate, if it's a limb, for example, um, and book them for theater. Likely this patient is very unwell, so you would book them uh, into seaport theater. And don't forget to escalate. Um, I think ultimately, although it may seem as though you're managing this patient by yourself, you need to discuss this patient with your registrar and your consultant. You know, you you you, you uh, define your management plan. You tell them what you're hoping to do, and they would be in a position to give you ad advice about definitive management. This also includes discussing it with the wider team as well. So your um, HTU and ITU teams. This patient may need inotropic support post-operatively, so it's good to book a, a HTU bed and think ahead. Uh, discuss this with your uh, anesthetist and the theater coordinators as well, as well as the CPOP team. Okay, so uh, to summarize everything I've just mentioned in the previous slide, um, a good response would be, um, okay, fine, my differentials are this, hypovolemic shock from an intra-abdominal bleed, septic shock from an asthmatic leak or cardiogenic shock, which could be from an MI or an, um, or an embolus. If the patient continues to deteriorate, then I would optimize them for theater by making them nil by mouth, documenting the last oral intake before consenting and booking them for CPOT theater. I would then immediately escalate this patient to my uh, registrar and consultant to demonstrate to the interviewers that, you know, you are a safe trainee and you, ensure that you're escalating early to try and make sure this patient is, is managed as early as possible. Immediate management. Um, so what can you do at the bedside to stabilize them? Obviously we've given, we've given him fluids. If he doesn't respond, we can give him bloods as well. If you're worried about sepsis, you can start him on antibiotics and start the sepsis six. Um, if the, if you're worried about cardiogenic shock and you're worried that the electrolytes could be deranged, um, there are ways in which you can manage this as well. Ultimately, you want to discuss this with your seniors directly, as well as the MDT team as um, to ensure that this patient goes to theater for an exploratory uh, laparotomy. And um, before I move on, I think it's important to, when you're describing your definitive management, try and say what you think this patient should have. So if this patient has an intra-abdominal bleed, they'll likely need an ex exploratory laparotomy. If the patient, you know, if it was a different, um, I don't know, different scenario and the patient was an obstruction, this patient needs a catheter. Uh, if you can't get a catheter in, then you tell the urology team and they may need a, a suprapubic catheter. So at every, at the, when you're describing your, your management, try and explicitly say what you, you feel this patient should have. Okay, so once that's done, you'd have pretty much answered the question. Um, and you usually have roughly two minutes or one minute um, within which they can ask you a follow-up question. Now, follow-up questions are usually related to the uh, CRISP scenario that they've given you. So they could then ask you, fine, okay, um, you've given this patient fluids, but they're not responding. Um, what else would you do? So often if you find you, you're, you're, you're at this stage, it's good because you've answered one question and they're likely just trying to push you more to allow you to get more points and demonstrate how good you are. So we've got a patient here who's not really responded to fluids. What are we worried about? This patient is likely losing 
uh, fluid volume somewhere. So there's likely to be a bleed. If this patient is a non-responder, then your main concern is that of hemorrhage. So you want to escalate the you want to escalate the um, massive hemorrhage protocol. Um, so yeah, you pretty much say that you would um, transfuse this patient uh, to try and stabilize them as uh, as soon as possible. Um, you would give them O negative blood as soon as possible, but ultimately they would need to go to theater to stop the bleeding. And you know many of the things that we mentioned before. So discussing this with the MDT, you know MDT approach with the surgical team, anesthetist, theater coordinator, and intensive care team. Okay, so that's sort of the overall structure. Um, and I think, you know, if, if you can break it down into, fine, when I, when I get my scenario, I want to first um, provide an opening statement, which allows me to signpost what I'm going to do. Then I'll quickly go through my ATE. Once my ATE is done, I want to have a look at any surrounding documentation and results to get as much information as possible. If there are any outstanding investigations, I can request them at that point. And then I want to discuss and have a think about what's going on with the patient before planning uh, definitive management. Now, your, I think, you know, some of these points I've mentioned before. So it's important to remember that your interview, your clinical station isn't really an OSCE per se, because you don't have as much time. You've got three minutes, so you really do need to be succinct. Your, your responses for each section need to be sort of one to two sentence lines. Um, some sections will require longer responses, but if you can keep your overall answer within three minutes, you're doing quite well. Now, so this is, this is quite an interesting point. Um, some, uh, when, I, when I was pre preparing for my interview, um, there was some advice from seniors who had said that if the if you stop naturally, so let's say you've gone through your ATE and you stop before moving on to your, um, I don't know, your 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 management plan, for example. If the interviewer interjects and asks you what you would do next, this counts as prompting, and you you often get marked down for prompting. So what I would recommend is that without rushing and still maintaining a good pace, just go through your answer from start to finish. And this is good because it allows you to keep control of the answer. Um, it shows that you're continuously thinking about what you're going to do next. If you stop, I guess it, I guess to the interviewer, it may look as though you're stuck and need a bit more help. But I suppose if you just go through your answer from start to finish, um, it's a bit more smooth and it just means you can uh, get as many marks as possible. Um, and as you know, this goes without saying, try and keep your answers structured. And it's all about structure. I think whenever you start to feel flustered and you feel like you're forgetting something, try and find a structure that you can fall back on that is useful to you. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be anything that is, you know, common or out there. Um, just try and fall back on a structure that you that you're comfortable with. Okay, so are you allowed to write down notes or keywords before you talk? Um, mm, I don't know, actually, I'm, I don't, I don't think so. Um, but I think you also have to consider that you've got three minutes and how much time are you going to spend writing down notes? So theoretically you probably could, I'd imagine probably not because they try and keep the interview fair. And I suppose from the interviewer's perspective, they don't really know what you're writing down. And then for you to the, have, then have to show them that you're writing down notes, it's, it's just very time consuming. So simple answer to that is, I, I don't think so. I don't think, I pro probably not, I would say. Um, you can do, but it's also, you know, it's also taking away from, taking time away from your, your, your answer, uh, essentially. Fine, so those are sort of general tips. Um, one last little plug, um, following my interview, myself and a few registrars and other core trainees as well have started to develop a, a resource that we hope will be useful to applicants for this year and uh, many years going forward. Um, I found that the the CST interview book, interview book was good, um, but I'm quite lazy in the sense that I prefer I much prefer to watch and listen to something. So you know, audiovisual resources are are the way to go for me personally. And this is what you know. I found other other candidates felt the same way too. So 
what we've done is we've uh, we've essentially created a video bank of um, particular uh, scenarios that often come up um, divided into your two stations, so your management and clinical interview stations as well. Um, this is still an ongoing project. We have some free videos on the website as well, um, and we're still collecting feedback and hopefully trying to, to to develop the resource. So if if you you know if you're curious and want to find out more, then definitely have a look at it. Obviously, I, I'm, I'm slightly biased because uh, I'm involved, but um, I, I think it's a pretty good resource. So definitely have a look and leave feedback if you do decide to um, to have a look as well. And I think that is it. So if we have more questions, is there an email? We can, yes, um, I think Freya will share my email or I can just share my email in the chat. Uh, do you mind, Freya, if I share my email in the chat? Yeah, please do. Please share your email. That's great if you um, are willing to be contacted. Perfect. Always happy to be contacted. All right. So there's a couple more yeah. questions. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, thank you so much, Garakai. I think we can all agree that that was excellent and really, really useful for preparing for the interview. Um, I've had a look at your resource myself and it's mm -hmm. brilliant. Um, so I would urge everyone to take a look. Um, so let's um, take a couple of minutes mm -hmm. for questions. So um, there's a question here that says, just to clarify, is three minutes for ABCDE mm -hmm. plus defin definitive management with two minutes for the additional questions? So um, I think just to be clear, this this isn't a, um, a strict sort of, um, you know, strict time division, I guess. Um, a good answer, I, in my opinion, is roughly three, three to four minutes. Um, you can take longer, but this then doesn't allow the interviewer to ask you more questions. And speaking for five minutes is quite a long time to be talking. So you're sort of trying to balance, not boring the interviewer, trying to get your answer out as, as quickly as you can and as succinctly as you can. So for me, I felt three minutes was a good amount of time to talk through your, your ATE and your management plan with sort of one minute and a half to two minutes of additional questions. And I think that makes for a fairly rounded and balanced interview, in my opinion. So, you know, it's 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 not it's not a, a set timeline. It's not a set time time restriction. You can spend as long as you want answering one question if you'd like. Brilliant. 